the tumultuous storm of economic uncertainty, where fortunes rise and fall like waves crashing upon the shore, Jordan Peterson stands as a beacon of truth, daring to unveil the harrowing reality that lies beyond our wildest imagination, the impending recession. As the dark clouds of financial turmoil gather on the horizon, Peterson's voice thunders to the chaos. This winter, tens of millions of British citizens, including children, will be tipped or dumped into energy poverty severe enough to risk permanent damage to their health. Cold, damp houses provide the perfect breeding ground for mold that not only causes respiratory distress, but renders houses essentially unlivable once established. Here's an interesting thing. I think that's happening with the... So, the LGBT power groups are exclusion, excluded groups, right? And so it started out with gay rights. And then one of the things that's happened that's so interesting, so you could think of, there was a normative group and there was excluded people. Okay, and so one section of the excluded people stood up and said, hey, you know, enough of this exclusion. So we're going to categorize ourselves and we're going to fight for recognition as the excluded. We're going to fight to be included. But what happens is, well, it's L and then it's LB and then it's LBG and then it's LGBT. And the last thing I saw, which was actually handed to the medical students in, at the University of Toronto, there's 20 letters. Why? Well, because you can't, I, this is tangentially related to this story only, you can't come up with a category of the things that don't fit inside categories. Because there's an infinite number of things that don't fit inside categories. And so when you try to build a category out of all uncategorical entities, all that happens is it starts to fragment. Because there's actually no unity there. And what, one of the things you are starting to see is that there's power battles emerging on the part of the excluded, on the left. And it's inevitable. Because, and, and I think that's what this story is trying to represent, is that you can't build the state up beyond a certain size. If you do, it will fragment and fall apart. The people within it will no longer speak the same language, and they'll, they'll, they'll disperse themselves to different corners of the earth. I worked on a UN committee, oh, it's got to be 10 years ago now, um, to help draft the UN Secretary General's report on sustainable economic development. And so I looked at all sorts of things like that. I was very curious, for example, about because people have been beating the overpopulation drum since, well, it really kicked in in the 1960s, you know, because there were dire predictions. By the year 2000, the Club of Rome came out and said, well, there'll be riots and mass starvation and mass movement of, of migrants and all the things you hear about climate change because there's too many people on the planet. And that just didn't happen at all. That was just, that it wasn't just wrong, it was anti-true. It was absolutely wrong. What happened instead was that everyone got way richer and the, the bottom section of the population in terms of economic distribution got lifted out of poverty. Inequality still exists, but that's that power law phenomenon we already talked about. Not that that's trivial, it's just unbelievably difficult to determine what to do with. There are solutions, but certainly getting rid of capitalism isn't the solution. Um, and so I looked at population trends and first of all found, not that this is an act of genius or anything, that as soon as you educate women, the, the size of family shrinks precipitously, like below replacement. And that's partly because women have other options. That, that's a huge part We're seeing part this play out. Hmm? Oh, yes. I mean, all the, all the countries in the West are way below re replacement. Korea is way below replacement. South Korea, Japan, way below replacement. Yeah, yeah. I it's, think the number one, not good. Uh, number one on the planet is, might be Chad. Chad, the country. In uh, terms of growth? Uh, eight children on average. Yeah, I think Nigeria will have more people in it than China by the end of the century. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Musk, you know, he's a far looking man. And, and so he's looking around the apocalyptic corner, let's say. And like, oh, oh, we're running out of people. And what that means, of course, is that you run out of young people, right? You don't run out of old people first because everyone who is here now is going to be 30 years older in 30 years. And, It'll be young people we don't have enough of, and of course, young people are the ones who do the innovation and are going to do most of the heavy lifting, etc. And so there's going to be a terrible shortage of young people. And so I think we're actually in real danger of forgetting this. And one of the things that I saw, I read a couple of ominous things. So 
If you plot the size of economic catastrophes over the last 30 years, they're getting bigger each time. So that's scary. Now, part of that is because the world economy is getting bigger, and so maybe you have to control for that. But the magnitude of the chaos has been increasing with each collapse. Okay. Uh, one of the things that came out of the last collapse, 2008, was the government rescuing collapsed companies like AIG and, and the Royal Bank of Scotland, which by the way was the biggest company in the world, no one knows that, but Royal Bank of Scotland collapsed, it was the biggest company in the world, and AIG was the insurer of insurers, and so it collapsed too, they were rescued by the government, and maybe fair enough, but one of the motifs that came out of that was the idea of too big to fail, well this story says, wait a second, it says too big means definite failure, it means inevitable failure, and that strikes me as highly probable, is that there's a warning in this story, although it's, 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 a, it's a bare story, right, it's only four or five lines, it's just the outlines, but it's placed in a very particular place, it's placed right after the flood, right, it's like, well there's the nihilistic chaos of the flood, and then there's the temp totalitarian temptation to build hyperstructures that can theoretically replace the transcendent, well, what happens? You build the hyperstructure and it fragments from within. And then people don't speak the same language and they, and they you know, distribute themselves sort of chaotically on the surface of the earth. Yeah, well, and th this idea that the planet has too many people on it, this is, I, there's no sentiment more implicitly genocidal than that statement. <laughs> so what do you mean too many people? Exactly. And what do you mean the planet? And what do you propose to do about that exactly? Mass abortion, is that your answer? Or should we do something a little more dramatic? Maybe we'll just shame people out of having children. And I've seen people do that, literally. I saw a professor when I was at a, uh, um, uh, a TED, I think it was, it doesn't matter. It was a number of professors talking to a couple hundred students. And one of the professors who was an environmentalist activist type, and. He got up on stage and shook his finger to the whole young crowd saying that him and his wife had only decided to have one child, which was, in my opinion, one child too many for him, mm -hmm. and told all the young people there if they had a shred of ethical decency that they would lim severely limit their reproductive potential. And I stood up and said that I thought that, that was the most, one of the most appalling things I'd ever heard anyone in academia say to young people, which is really saying something because they say plenty of appalling things. And it was a very uncomfortable moment and he huffed off the stage. But, you know, in a frenzy talking about how you couldn't talk about such things without being pilloried on ethical grounds. And yeah, that's for sure. You come out as a what, emissary of the academic establishment. You tell young people that humanity is so corrupt that they should seriously consider not propagating because that violates the deepest of ethical norms and you think that's a good thing and that that's your right and it was just beyond comprehension it's beyond comprehension but it's associated with like a deeply rooted existential self-hatred I mean, and, and i mean hatred at the level of humanity is like a virus on the planet that we're a cancerous growth alex epstein on. calls this human racism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. right right and it's that yeah, well, we're a cancer on the planet, you know, unchecked growth, just like a cancer. It's like, that's us, say eh? a cancer. It's okay. We know where your heart is located. Because what's, what's the implications for, for a doctrine like that? What do you do with a cancer? Cut it out. Yeah, that's for sure. Poison it or whatever, whatever. There's nothing you don't do to a cancer. So you're going to use a metaphor like that? There's too many people on the planet. You're going to use a metaphor like that? You know, and then you're going to, you're going to also decide that you're virtuous while you're using it because you're on the side of the planet, whatever the hell that means. So, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. And a huge part of it's rooted in this existential shame and, and, and horror at the condition of being human and the fact that life is rife with suffering and a lot of it's unjustified. And, you know, it's a Mephistophelian position. So Mephistopheles was laid out, portrayed in Goethe's Faust. Um, that's the story of a man who sold his soul to the devil for knowledge. It's a story of intellectual pride, and Goethe stands in relationship to German literature in the same manner that Shakespeare stands in relationship to English literature. And Goethe's Mephistopheles 
says straight out twice in in the play once in the first there's two books and once in the first book and once in the second Goethe has him restate it twice existence is such a foul thing because of all its suffering essentially that it would be better if it was merely anni- annihilated and that's the Mephistophelian stance this whole show should just come to a halt look at how corrupt people are evil reigns everywhere it's nothing but will to power we're destroying the planet um, with our unchecked ambition all of it rooted in greed and 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 machiavellianism and jockeying for position and we're so contemptible that we should just roll up and die and we should shame women into not having children and we should shame men so they never manifest any planet destroying ambition and it's it's unbelievably appalling. It goes all the way down to the bottom, the bottom of things. That's what's tearing our culture apart, this dispute about the nature of existence at the most fundamental level. So, And the universities have come out on the wrong side. The narcissists of compassion, callow, self-aggrandizing, incompetent politicians, their celebrity lackeys, Machiavellian journalists, have insisted ever more loudly over the last five decades that no cost was and is too great for others to bear in the pursuit of blind service to the planet. It is irresistibly tempting at the moment for those on that bandwagon to single out and demonize Vladimir Putin for Europe's energy woes, but his current machinations were utterly enabled by the green ideologues Anyone with eyes could see a decade ago that the idiot insistence that Europe make itself reliant on Russia for its energy security made the current situation inevitable. Remember when President Donald Trump, populist menace numero uno, was mocked and derided by the intellectual and political elite in Europe and North America for trumpeting precisely that warning? Well, now the chickens have truly come home to roost but very little has yet been learned in consequence. Virtue signaling utopians committed to globalization claim we are destroying the planet with cheap energy. But are they truly and deeply committed to the environmental sustainability so loudly and insistently demanded? Or are they merely hell-bent in the prototypically Marxist manner in taking revenge on capitalism? It appears to be the latter, Why otherwise would the mavens of the environmental movement oppose nuclear power, despite its optimal carbon footprint? Why would they demonize the exceptionally clean natural gas whose fracking-enabled production has allowed the U.S. to dramatically cut the very carbon output that is so hypothetically undesirable? Utility bills have soared in the U.K., the home of the Industrial Revolution that lifted the world out of poverty, Now, up to half of small businesses in Britain face the risk of bankruptcy and closure. The government has had to announce a ruinously expensive energy price guarantee to mitigate the worst effects of this disaster. The rush to renewables. The mentality among the eco-extremists is as follows. If we have to doom the poor to destroy the system that made the rich, so be it. You just can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. Here are some facts to remember while we so madly and ineffectively rush to renewables. The International Energy Agency recently indicated that two decades of intense support for such undertakings has hiked the proportion of energy provided by such means from 13 to 14% to an utterly underwhelming 15.7%. If all governments deliver on their current climate policies, the world will derive no more than 28% of its energy that way by 2050, and 100% by 2207. Not 2030 or 2035, but 200 years later. In the battleground of ideas, Jordan Peterson emerges as a lightning rod, captivating audiences with his controversial viewpoints and challenging the status quo, igniting passionate debates amongst scholars and thinkers. With the fervor of a philosopher challenging long-held beliefs, Peterson's controversial ideas force us to confront uncomfortable truths. 
once you start to succeed at something, the probability that you will continue to succeed ever more rapidly increases. So there's, exp there's an exponential function with regards to success. But there's also an exponential function with regards to failure. So failure and, and, and success aren't like this. They're like this. Fail, fail, die. Succeed, succeed, succeed ridiculously. What are you mad about? Write it down. And, and like, be kind of comprehensive about it. Or maybe talk to a friend. I would, I would say write it down. But you can talk to a friend. Write down everything that makes you angry. And you're going to think, well, some of those things that make me angry are stupid. It's like, yeah, probably. That's not the question here. We're not trying to figure out if you're reasonable or not. Of course you're not, because who is? So you're not. So write down everything that makes you angry. Okay, so what will happen then is you have a comprehensive list of what makes you angry. And the first thing that you'll figure out is that some of those things just shouldn't make you angry. It's like time to grow the hell up, you know, and get over that. But then there's other things on there. And maybe you can talk to someone about that. You think, well, this makes me angry. Should it? You talk to someone, they say, no, you should. That's you. You should just grow up. But, you know, so maybe that's 10% of the things that make you angry is just because you're undisciplined. The best, way, the best way to teach people critical thinking is to teach them to write. And I, I made this little thing that I put online. It's, I don't know, if maybe, it, is it in the Psych 434 website? Did, did I post that rubric for essay writing? I don't think I actually went through it, but it is still on 434. Is it not on 434? Is that not working? Oh. Yeah. But, but I still found it. It's still on 434. Oh, okay. Well, there's an essay. Oh, that's too bad. It's not on the Psych 434 website even, because I updated it. Anyways, I have this guide to writing that's that. If it isn't on the 434 website, it is definitely on the 430 website, and uh, it steps people through the process of writing. Because what's happened now, it's very hard to teach people to write because it's unbelievably time intensive, and like writing, marking a good essay, that's really easy. Check A. You did everything right. right. Marking a bad essay? Oh my god. The words are wrong, the phrases are wrong, the sentences are wrong, they're not ordered right in the paragraphs, the paragraphs aren't coherent, and the whole thing makes no sense. So, trying to tell the person what they did wrong, it's like, well, you did everything wrong. Everything about this essay is wrong. Well, that's not helpful either. You have to find the few little things they did half right, and you have to teach them what they did wrong. It's really expensive. And so what I did with this rubric was try to address that from the production side instead of the grading side. But the best thing you can do is teach people to write. Because there's no difference between that and thinking. It's like, you know, in some way people can go to hell in a handbasket if, if they're inclined to. Mm -hmm. Now, I would rather have that not happen. But you know, people are, what would you say, doomed to their own autonomy. But I'm not saying words that other people want me to say. And the idea of compelled speech, it's like, the bill was this much about gender. Right. You're being taken advantage of, or you're allowing yourself to be taken advantage of, or you're taking advantage of yourself, or you're not objecting when someone else is asking you to do something you don't really want, like there's something going on. And so with those things, you figure out, well, what would you rather have? Like if you could have what you wanted that wasn't making you angry, what would it be? And so now you know what you want, well, then you think, well, let's take one of those things that I want and see if I can ask for it. Maybe it's like the, the, woman, the person who asked this question, the woman who asked this previous question. Maybe she has to go to her husband and say, look, I need you to spend 15 minutes after dinner with the kids so I can, you know, be alone. Would you, would you do it for 15 minutes? or 10 minutes, or would you do it for 10 minutes like three times a week? You know, you, can, you have to negotiate what's the other person willing to do. You need to know what you want and need, and then you need to communicate it to them, and then you need to negotiate a solution. And that's how you get more assertive. And you start small. You get more assertive by telling the truth, right? That's how. It's like, I, I'm irritated and annoyed that this isn't happening, and here's something that you could conceivably offer me and this is what I'm willing to do in return and could we see if that works and what's the benefit to them is well you're not miserable and passive aggressive then you know it's like it's not like your partner isn't going to gain from your increment in assertiveness it's not a zero-sum game you could both gain like 
truly, because wouldn't it be a lovely marriage if your, your wife could ask you what she wanted and you could deliver and you could ask her what you wanted and she'd deliver and both of you were happy about that. Like that could happen, not always and in every situation, but you can get a long way down that road if you're careful, you know. A book called A Billion Wicked Thoughts that was written by a bunch of engineers at Google and they were looking at billions of search, uh, billions of Google searches. And you know, there's no shortage of pornography on the internet. And, it, and there's much less by proportion than there was when the internet was first invented. And it's so interesting because it actually turned out that one of the things that drove the development of the internet and the technology was the proclivity of young men to search out sexually provocative images. That was what was at the forefront of the development of the net. It's extraordinarily interesting. They were motivated to, they were motivated to use it for that purpose and that provided the platform from which it emerged. Amazing. Anyways, the Google engineers looked at pornographic search processes and then segregated male searches from female searches and what they found was that the male searched out images surprise surprise no one no one considers that you know particularly interesting but the female searched out literary representations of pornography it was written and so i can give you an example of that if you know about harlequin romances does everybody still know about those anybody not know about those okay well they're mass market romances and of, of a very stereotypical type and uh, they're, the original ones were pretty harmless in, in terms of no violence and no real sexual contact, con content. But that was 40 years ago and they've differentiated tremendously and now there's hardcore Harlequin romances and with, with particularly garish covers and then there's the old, you know, more tame, basic, sexless and aggressionless romances where everything is implied and not explicit, but the explicit ones exist. So they did a plot analysis of the typical pornographic female fantasy. Well, and it was so, it's so comical because engineers did this and social scientists would never do this because they'd be probably too concerned about the ethics of it or some damn thing. But engineers, you know, they'll just plow ahead with no concern whatsoever for such things. And they actually discover things that way. And so they, they discovered the basic plot of the female pornographic literary product. And they identified, so basically what happened was that a innocent, well-meaning, and attractive young woman encounters a male who's a bit of a monster. And the monster, there's five types of classic male monster. For all you males who want to know, this is what you can become. Vampire, that's a good one. Werewolf, billionaire, pirate, and surgeon. Okay, so that's very interesting because well, first of all, there's a dominance thing. There's a, now you're actually blushing, you know, you're actually blushing about that. That's very, very funny. So, <laughs> sorry to point it out, but it's so comical, you know. I know, I know, it's so funny. I, I, I was reading this, I was reading this, it was just cracking me up. I thought, oh my God, really? Pirate, vampire, oh, that explains it. What about all these damn vampire shows, right? They're so popular online, they're so popular on Netflix. Oh yes, and then there's the werewolf. There's nothing sexier than a werewolf, apparently. But I mean, so there's predatory, do there's predatory dominance that's implicit in that, right? With the billionaire, it's more abstract, but clearly that's an indication of very high success in the male dominance hierarchy. So, but there's this desire for aggression that's in that, a real aggression. Right, and it's not surprising to me, to me at all. It makes perfect sense. Um, but what, but the basic plot is that the woman encounters this mysterious and aggressive male and tames him. That's the female hero myth, as far as I can tell. It's Beauty and the Beast, and so it's because well, there's no fun in taming someone who's already tame. And what makes you think you really want someone who's tame anyways? There's no interest in that. Plus, when, when, when chaos manifests itself, what makes you think that someone tame is gonna be good for anything? And it's a real question, and so that aggression is absolutely vital, it's absolutely necessary. But, because it's inc incredibly dangerous, which of course it is, it has to be civilized. And so what happens is that the archetypal female in these pornographic romances seduces and tames the aggressive male. And that's her encounter 
with chaos. Now it's more, it's more comp. Of course, females they're more complicated, and that's exactly how it is. And it's no wonder because their their lives are more complicated. Look, every ideal is a judge, right? So you posit an ideal, and instantly you're in inferior position in relationship to that ideal, and that can be crushing. Okay, so what do you do about that? Well, one answer is no ideals. Well, that's not a good answer because then you don't have anything to do, right? So, so, and that deprives you of a main source of pleasure, which is observed, uh, generated as a consequence of observed movement towards a valued goal. So, if you have a high goal and you see any movement towards it, there's a potential, there's a really powerful potential kick there. So, you don't want to dispense with that. But then if you set up an ideal, it can judge you very harshly. So then you have to rearrange your reward philosophy. And instead of punishing yourself from, as a consequence of perceived distance, you reward yourself for incremental movement forward. And that's not just theoretical. Look, I was stopped by three guys on the street this week, three separate occasions. And they all told me the same thing. They, you know, they, they, they said that they had read or something I wrote or listened to something or watched something and that it had been helpful. And whenever ever anybody says that to me, I always ask them, okay, exactly what was helpful and what changed? Because I want to know what's helping so that I can understand the target and hit it better. And so, and generally people are, are pleased to tell me, um, although sometimes it takes them a while to formulate exactly the description, but they, all three of them said, um, I stopped comparing myself to other people. So I stopped comparing what I didn't have to what other people had. I left that off the table. And then I started to reward myself for improving over what I was yesterday. So they, and that's profound change because it means that you actually get your reward structure transformed. And one of the things that just blows me away about universities is that no one ever tells students why they should write something. It's like, well, you have to do this assignment. Well, why are you writing? Well, you need the grade. It's like, no, you need to learn to think because thinking makes you act effectively in the world. Thinking makes you win the battles you undertake. And those could be battles for good things. If you can think and speak and write, you are absolutely deadly. Nothing can get in your way. So that's why you learn to write. It's like, and I can't believe that people aren't just told that. It's, it's, it's like, it's the most powerful weapon you can possibly provide someone with. And I, I mean, I know lots of people who've been staggeringly successful and watched them throughout my life. I mean, those people, you don't want to have an argument with them. They'll just slash you into pieces. And not in a malevolent way. It's like, if you're going to make your point and they're going to make their point, you better have your points organized because otherwise you are going to look like and be an absolute idiot. You are not going to get anywhere. And if you can formulate your arguments coherently and make a presentation, if you can speak to people, if you can lay out a proposal, God, people give you money, they give you opportunities, you have influence, that's what you're at university for. And so that's what you do. Is you, and that's, you're, in, you're in English, right? You're, and yeah, in languages, anyways. It's like, yeah, te teach people to be articulate because that's the most dangerous thing you can possibly be. It's like you really are your only comparison group, especially as you get older, because your life is so idiosyncratic and peculiar that any compare. I mean, look, you have to care what other people think. It's stupid to think otherwise because you have to be social and you have to be aware of what other people are doing and all of that. So it's this is psychopathic individual individuality, but it is genuinely true that no one has your set of opportunities and limitations. And so the, the, the comparison just isn't real. It can't be sufficiently multidimensional. You know, because maybe you see someone who's rich. I've dealt with, I've, I've met many people who are very, very rich. And you can look at their lives and they have these huge houses and material plenty, but, and they're shielded from many catastrophes that would hit someone without those resources harder. But their lives are still full of exactly the same troubles that characterize human life in general. 
And so you, you compare yourself on one dimension. You don't see, well, the person's worked 80 hours a week for 40 years and it's blown all his relationships out of the water. It's like, yes, he's rich, but he's also old now. You know, he's 60. And one of the best predictors of wealth is age. You know, really, do you want to be young and poor or old and rich? It's like, I'd pick young and poor because you can't buy youth. In the depths of solitude, Jordan Peterson unveils a chilling truth that reverberates through the corridors of human experience, exposing a harrowing reason why we must confront and conquer the haunting specter of loneliness. Pick up your damn suffering and bear it. And try to be a good person so you don't make it worse. With unyielding resolve, Peterson peels back the layers of this heart-wrenching reality, revealing that loneliness is not merely an emotional state, but a profound existential crisis that strikes at the very core of our human experience. Sometimes people think they're better than they are, like objectively, whatever that means. Peterson's insights cut through that veil of denial that's so common, exposing the sinister nature of loneliness as a precursor to mental and physical decline a breeding ground for depression, anxiety, and a host of other afflictions that haunt our lives. If, you, if all of those things are going well for you and you feel terrible all the time, then you're depressed. Because there's, there's something wrong with your emotional regulation. You know, I mean, maybe you're having an existential crisis. That's a possibility. But I mean, let's assume we can't see anything structurally wrong with your life, but you're feeling terrible. Then I would say, well, you have depression. There's something wrong. Maybe it's physiological. And, People like that, in my experience, those are the people who often really benefit from antidepressants. In a world that paradoxically thrives on hyperconnectivity, Peterson's somber words serve as a wake-up call, reminding us that the epidemic loneliness lurks in the shadows, silently devouring our collective humanity. The depths of Peterson's revelations reverberate within our hearts, awakening a deep yearning for authentic connection. For he reminds us that to overcome loneliness is to embark on a courageous self-journey of self-discovery. He basically pointed out that what should happen is, let's say with your aggression, and hopefully you have some, is that it gets socialized. And so you, you learn how to play games, but you don't drop your drive to win. You integrate that in the games. And so you try to win, you try to play hard, but if you're defeated or you hit something negative, you don't respond negatively. And you can keep that all bounded within being a, fair, a, a good player, a fair, a fair player. Jordan reminds us that the battle against loneliness is not a solitary one, but it's it's more of a more of a collective effort to create spaces of belonging, spaces of empathy and understanding that bridge the chasms between hearts. That implies is that we have evolved to climb up dominance hierarchies. And then I would say it's not exactly that even because there are many different dominance hierarchies. And so the skills that you might use to climb up one might not be necessarily the same skills that you would use to climb up another. And so then I would say what we have evolved for. Most people who are cowards disguise their coward cowardice as morality and they claim that their harmlessness, which is actually a consequence of their fear and inability to be harmful, say, or to be dangerous, is actually a sign of their moral integrity. The first is you're not depressed. You've had terrible things happen to you. That's not the same thing, right? I distinguish between them. If a client comes to me and they say they're feeling very sad and down and, and anxious and worried about everything and so forth, then I kind of walk through their life. Do they have friends? Do they have a family? Do they have a meaningful job? Is their educational background appropriate for their level of intelligence and ability? Are they taking care of themselves? Do they have something to look forward to? Do they use their time outside of work productively and wisely, etc.? So you think about those as the dimensions of a good life. There's more, or maybe there's fewer, but that's not too bad for a, for a quick and dirty first pass through, let's say. Um, those are the dimensions, by the way, that you work on. If you do the future authoring program in the self-authoring suite, you're asked to think about all those dimensions and consider what your life might be like if you optimized along all of them. You could say reasonable that, reasonably that female 
human beings do the same thing to male human beings. And there's some of that vice versa too, like we evaluate each other, for example, for symmetry, which is one of the elements of beauty, because healthier people tend to be more symmetrical, and lots of animals use symmetry. Butterflies, if butterflies won't mate with another butterfly, if it deviates from symmetry, by the tiniest amounts you can imagine. So symmetry is a marker, and there's other markers, like shoulder width to waist width is one, and waist width to hip width is another, that's usually what Males use that to evaluate females in part. So there's lots of markers of health. Um, but it also looks to me like the, the, the data worldwide seems to indicate that women, so imagine that women mate across dominance hierarchies and up, socioeconomically speaking. And on average across cultures, women go for men who are about four to five years older. You know, it varies. In the Scandinavian countries, that's shrunk a little bit, but not that much. And in other cultures, it's bigger. I would say that depends to some degree on difficulty of establishing economic independence, right? Because in richer countries, it's easier to have enough economic independence if you're a male to be, to be a useful participant in the process of having children. Um, but it doesn't matter, cross-culturally, it's still a cross and up where men mate to cross and down. They don't care much about socioeconomic status. It doesn't seem to be part of their selection method, um, generally speaking. Well, you don't get together in a damn bob, because all that does is allow you to be as horrible as you could possibly imagine and suffer from none of the consequences. That's a bad idea. So how about we don't do that? Well, there's a deep idea in the West too. It's like, pick up your damn suffering and bear it. And try to be a good person so you don't make it worse. Well, that's a truth, you know? I read a lot about the terrible things that people have done to each other. You just cannot even imagine it. It's so awful. So you don't want to be someone like that. Now, do you have a reason to be? Yes. You have a lots of reasons to be. God, there's reasons to be resentful about your existence. Everyone you know is going to die. You know, you too. And there's going to be a fair bit of pain along the way, and lots of it's going to be unfair. It's like, yeah, no wonder you're resentful. It's like, act it out and see what happens. You make everything you're complaining about infinitely worse. There's this idea that hell is a bottomless pit, and that's because no matter how bad it is, some stupid son of a bitch like you could figure out a way to make it a lot worse. <laughs> so you think, well, what do you do about that? Well, you accept it. That's what life is like. It's suffering. That's what the religious people have always said. Life is suffering. Yes. Well, who wants to admit that? Well, just think about it. Well, so what do you do in the face of that suffering? Try to reduce it. Start with yourself. What good are you? Get yourself together for Christ's sake so that when your father dies, you're not whining away in a corner and you can help plan the funeral and you can stand up solidly so that people can rely on you. That's better. Don't be a damn victim. Of course you're a victim. Jesus, obviously. Put yourself together. The dominance hierarchy is part of nature, and because it's so ancient, you have to consider it as part of the mechanism that has played the role of selection in the process of natural selection, and so, um, roughly see what seems to happen is that there is a plethora of dominance hierarchies especially in complex human communities and many of them are masculine in structure in that there are dominance hierarchies that primarily men compete in or that has been the historical norm and that some men rise to the top based on whatever the dominance hierarchy is based on and they make their preferential mates and it's a good strategy for women to engage in because why and, and many sorts of female animals do precisely this is they let the males battle it out and then pick from the top and or often the dominant males there's no choice on the part of the females it's the dominant males just chasing away the subordinate males but with humans it's usually the case that the females have the opportunity to do at least some choosing. Is the ability to climb up the set of all possible dominance hierarchies, 
right? And that's a, that's a whole different idea. It's like the averaged hierarchy across vast spans of time. And I think it's for that reason that we, among others, that we evolve general intelligence because general intelligence is a general problem-solving mechanism and it seems to be situation independent, so to speak. Those who act out the role of the victor in those standard narratives are precisely the people who attain victory in life. And, and I would say biologically defined in that they make more attractive partners, but also I believe that there's an alignment between human well-being, which is a very weak word, and participation in these meta-narratives that drive success. Because, well, do you want to be a failure or a success? Well, you know, it's hard to be a success. You have to adopt a lot of responsibility. And so you might be willing to take your chances as a failure, but I can't exactly, I'm not going to make the presumption that that's going to put you in a situation other than one where you experience a lot of frustration, anger, disappointment, depression, pain, and anxiety. The significance of the experience is roughly what you can derive from listening to the experience that will change the way that you look at the world and act in the world. So it's valuable information and they can tell you a terrible story and that can be valuable because that can tell you how not to look in the world look at the world and act in it, or they can tell you a positive story, you can derive benefit either way, which is why we also like to go watch stories about horrible psychopathic thugs, um, you know, and, and hopefully we're learning not to be like them. Although there are additional advantages in that, you know, someone who, you might be some, say that someone who is incapable of cruelty is a higher moral being than someone who is capable of cruelty. And I would say, and this follows Jung as well, that that's incorrect and it's dangerously incorrect because if you are not capable of cruelty, you are absolutely a victim to anyone who is. And so part of the reason that people go watch anti-heroes and villains is because there's a part of them crying out for the incorporation of the monster within them which is what gives them strength of character and self-respect because it's impossible to respect yourself until you grow teeth. And if you grow teeth, then you realize that you're somewhat dangerous and, or maybe somewhat seriously dangerous. And then you might be more willing to demand that you treat yourself with respect and other people do the same thing. And so that doesn't mean that being cruel is better than not being cruel. What it means is that being able to be cruel and then not being cruel is better than not being able to be cruel. And this is something the positive illusion people never think about either, is that sometimes people think they're better than they are, like objectively, whatever that means, but lots of times the opposite is true. And I, and I think often it's true even more often. It's like people think they're a lot worse than they are. No one's as anxious as me or as concerned about X or you know, as confused about this or, you know, as socially awkward or as not funny or, you know, everybody's got their paranoia about this part of them that's the worst that anyone could possibly be in the entire world. And it's almost never, almost never true. You know, other people are a lot more like that than you think. And they're running around trying to hide it madly as well. So, so that's a good thing. Well, you know, you also allow your, in some sense, you're allowing yourself out into the light. You're going to be sacrificing yourself to other people all the time. And there are people who will find that extraordinarily endearing. And it will be under some circumstances, but the problem is, is that you will sacrifice yourself. And that's a really bad attitude to have, for example, towards adult males. It's a great thing for infants, but for adult males, it is the wrong approach. And so you will get taken advantage of continually by people who are looking for someone like you until you grow some teeth. And you'll think, no, no, that's the opposite of compassion. Being able to bite hard is the opposite of compassion, which it is. And so you'll have that pushed into the predator category. I'm not doing that, I'm not getting angry, I don't like conflict. It's like until you bring that out of the depths and put it on so you can use it, you're gonna be in trouble. And that's kind of Nietzsche's idea of the revaluation of good and evil, right? You have a sense of what's good and a sense of what isn't with your conscience, but it's not very smart. It's got things in the wrong boxes. And a lot of the things that even nature itself, a lot of the things that you accept 
as untrammeled goods, like compassion, let's say, have a very dark side, first of all, and second, are not enough to get you through life. You need the opposite virtues too. But then there's the other sort of person who, who is in trouble. You know, they, they, their educational attainment is not what it should be. They don't have a job. They have an alcohol or drug problem. They have a family that's really not functioning well, or they don't have a family. Their immediate relationship, intimate relationship, is non-existent or terrible. Um, their friends are non-existent or 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 worthless and and destructive. Um, they don't get along with their relatives. They're in poor mental and physical health. You get the picture. That's and they're not feeling good. Their, their, their mood's low and they're anxious. That's not depression, like it might be, you know, but it's a terrible, but what that is, is a terrible life. And, and those are different things. They needed to be, they need to be conceptualized differently. Now, even if you have a terrible life, an antidepressant might be able to lift you up enough so that you can keep fighting, let's say, assuming that that's what you're doing. But an antidepressant obviously isn't going to help, isn't going to remove the facts of your terrible life. And then maybe if you put yourself together, you know how to do that. You know what's wrong with you, if you'll admit it. You know there's a few things you could like polish up a little bit that you might even be able to manage in your insufficient present condition. And so you might shine yourself up a little bit and then your eyes will be a little more open. Then you can shine yourself up a little bit more and then maybe you could bring your family together instead of having them be the hateful, spiteful, neurotic, infighting batch that you're like doomed to spend Christmas with. <laughs>